You know, when we talk about leadership today, we must ask ourselves certain fundamental questions. Who is a leader? Because we live in a world today where there are men and women who by dint of occupation of public office think that they are leaders. But many of them are not. Many of them are misleaders. And there is no shortage of such men and women both in this continent, in this country and the rest of the world. And it is incumbent upon us to realize that when our circumstances have been captured by men and women who are merely pretending to be leaders, then we will never realize what we desire. And what we desire is that justice must be done for all. What we desire is that the promises that have been made to us throughout the ages must be fulfilled. What we desire is that our dignity as human beings must never be undermined. What we desire is that we must give meaning to the words of the carpenter of Nazareth, that we are not children of a lesser God. What we must desire is the recognition, and this has been recognized throughout the ages, that we must be our brother's keeper. What we must desire is to ensure that we live in a world where we are judged not by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. That is what we desire. And we are gathered here today, therefore, to remind ourselves that throughout the ages, men and women have always realized their potential when there was clarity in their mind. We cannot afford to be of two minds. You who read the Bible will remember certain iconic moments in the Bible when the leaders are called upon to lead and the led are called upon to provide leadership in their own way. When you go out today, I want you to remember the story of that man called Elijah. You remember him saying to the prophets of Baal, and telling them the time has come that we must choose in order to move in the right direction. And he calls all of them and he says, let us not be of two opinions. If God is God, worship God. And if Baal is Baal, is God, worship Baal. I am today telling you that when you want to be a leader, you must be able to recognize what direction you are going to face. You cannot afford to be a two minds. I can also remember in the book of the prophet Joshua, which you are aware of, Joshua assembling all the hosts of Israel and asking them, choose you now whom you shall serve, whether you shall serve the Lord, the gods of our ancestors before we cross the river, or you shall serve the gods of the Amorites in whose land we sojourn, or you shall serve the Lord as for me and my house we have chosen to serve the Lord. Today I'm telling you that we must make choices. We must make choices and make the right choices. And you know, when I listen to the Reverend talking about those who ask him whether there is a distinction between being a pastor and being a person who is looking at the affairs of man, there is no distinction between church and politics. Church and politics are Siamese twins. Because the last time I checked, the divine instruction is that we must eat. And eating is a political issue. The last time I checked, I discovered that we must have water, and water is a political and a spiritual issue. The last time I checked, we must go to the toilet, and that is a political issue, and indeed also a biblical issue. The last time I checked, there is nothing that is in the Bible which is not a political question. It is therefore the duty of a pastor to be as political as politics can be. Because before we go to heaven, we must eat. Before we go to heaven, we, when we are sick, we must go to hospital. We must do that. So today, I'm, I'm, I'm here before you to remind every pastor wherever they are, every man of God that one of your greatest vocations is to be a politician. The question is, what kind of a politician? That is the only question. What kind of a politician? What kind of politics? Because there is politics and politics.
And the politics that we are talking about is the politics that will liberate our countries and will liberate our minds. When I remember the history of this country, I can still remember during the dark days of apartheid, I remember the voice of Desmond Pilo Tutu bellowing from the pulpits and telling the architects of apartheid that we cannot delude ourselves by pretending that we are singing hallelujah while our kith and kin are being judged on the basis of the color of their skin. We must sing hallelujah in the recognition that our duty is to be our brother and sister's keeper. Was Desmond Pilo too to a man of God and a politician? He was both and he had to be both. I can still remember the voice of Alan Busak beaming from the pulpit and saying, Behold, we must fight the injustices. And I can still go and remember the voice of Christ himself telling those who are standing in the way of fairness and justice that is incumbent upon us to be politicians. So today I'm inviting all of us to be politicians. I'm inviting all of us to be politicians because it is only when we are politicians who believe in certain virtues that we can liberate our countries. Because history has demonstrated not once, not twice, but times without number that when we abandon our political duties, when we are not devoted citizens, there is no shortage of men and women whose only desire is to devour us. It is our duty to stand in their way. It is our duty to deny them the oxygen that they need to survive. It is our duty to tell them unequivocally that we shall not allow you to run roughshod over us. It is our duty to remind them that you cannot normalize the absurd. It is our duty to remind them that they cannot be greedy to our detriment. It is our duty to remind them that we cannot allow ourselves to be led by men and women whose only claim to fame is that they are greedy beyond measure. It is our duty to remind them that we have a duty to make this world a good world for everybody else. It is our duty to remind them that whenever we have fought slavery, whenever we have fought colonization, whenever we fight neocolonization, whenever we have fought apartheid, we wanted our lives to be lived in a manner that was dignified. We must remind them. So today, we are here to remind ourselves that we must be leaders of ourselves because we have learned over the years that is only when you lead yourself, when you cleanse yourself, that you can be a good leader. You know, sometimes, and many are those times, when I read the story in the Bible, and I read about Jesus of Nazareth, and I wrap my mind about his humility, and I hear him many times saying that he did not come to be served, but he came to serve. Then I look at our leaders who, when they are seeking to serve us, and it's not only in South Africa, it is almost everywhere in the Bible, when they are seeking our support, they are humility personified. They kiss babies. <laughs> they go to the sheep inn. They drink from dirty cups. They walk on foot. They smile with us. They fo take photos with everybody. They discard their security. They are humility personified. They speak the language that we want to hear. They do the thing that they think we want to see them do. They delude us. They cheat us. And somehow we accept that they are leaders. But immediately they get what they want. Oh, they have a reverse Pauline conversion. 
If they were appalled, they go back to being souls. And we can no longer recognize them. When you ring them, their phones are picked by somebody called a PA, whose only claim to fame that he is rude beyond measure. When you go to the offices, when you go to the offices, they no longer want to see you. When they are driving in the streets, their sirens scare you. While I suspect that those who discovered the siren meant that it should be used for good purposes. For them it is a badge of honor and they harass us in the streets. They acquire things which they have not worked for. They want to be described as honorable even when they are horrible. These are the men that we have. And there is no shortage of such men and women in the African continent. They promise us things that they know they will never deliver. And we believe them. I am today telling us that a devoted citizen must have eyes that can see such individuals. Because who is a devoted citizen? A devoted citizen is a citizen who is aware of his or her circumstances. A devoted citizen is a citizen who is going to sacrifice for the sake of this generation and generations yet to be born. This country has had devoted citizens. Nelson Mandela was such a devoted citizen. Robert Mangalisa Sobukwe was such a devoted citizen. Chris Hani was such a devoted citizen. And I know that there are many others who are devoted, devoted citizens. Winnie Madikezela Mandela was such a devoted citizen. Albertina Sisulu was such a devoted citizen, and many Tirongoposte was such a devoted citizen. There has been no shortage of devoted citizens in this country, both known and unknown. And that is why this country is iconic. I remember when I talk about devoted citizens when I was a young graduate, when I was a young high school student, even when I was a primary school student, I remember history teaching me about the Sharpville massacre when men and women came out and they feared nothing and they were prepared to die and some of them died that you may leave. I remember in 1976, young primary school children dying that you may leave. I remember many great South Africans spending their time in jail, suffering that you may leave. The question now, are you devoted citizens? Or you have become champagne revolutionaries, whose only claim to fame is that you want to eat bacon in the morning and to have, have caviar at lunchtime and to have lamb chops in the evening and punctuate it with wine and then you say, behold, I'm a revolutionary. That is not revolution. Revolution is about recognizing what must be done and that it must be done with devotion and it must be done consistently and it must be done in a manner that is going to save the continent of Africa. That is what we are talking about. That is how I understand it and I I am of the view that this country and this continent must do it. Today, many times when I think about my continent, this continent of Africa, this mother continent, this continent that is the cradle of human civilization, this continent that has known abuse by the slavers, this continent that has been colonized, this continent that has known neo-colonization, this continent that has known appetite, this continent that is the home of all minerals known to man, this continent that is the home of rivers that produce waters, this continent that has over 1.4 billion, this continent which is great in prospect, but this continent which is at the lower rungs of the ladder, this continent I think of her, where are leaders? How can it be that in the 1940s we fought that we may drive out the colonizer? 
and the colonizer is coming back again. How can it be? How can it be that 60 years ago we regained our independence and our young men and women are now fighting to go to the land of the colonizers? How can it be? How can it be that 28 years ago you slew the giant that was appetite, but there is still appetite of an economic kind? How can it be? How can it be? And how can it be that we are comfortable in that environment? How can it be? It cannot be right. How can we claim that we are devoted citizens when those realities confront us on a daily basis? How can it be? I hear cries across the continent of Africa. I hear cries from that kind Senegal. They are asking, how can it be? That we cannot feed ourselves, they are asking in Dhaka. They are asking in the Gambia, how can it be? The same question is asked in Sierra Leone, in Burkina Faso, in Mali, in Benin, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Sudan, in South Sudan, in Somalia, in Mozambique, in Botswana, in Lesotho, in Eswatini, in South Africa. They are asking, how can it be? How can it be that every other civilization comes to our continent and takes away that which they desire and leave us in deprivation, they ask. They are asking, how can the world order be of such a nature that the French can come here and do what they will and go away without consequence? They are asking, how can the British come here and do what they will and live without consequence. They are asking, how is it that the Americans can come here and do what they will and live without consequence? They are asking, how can the Turks come here? How can the Arabs come here? Do what they will and live without consequence. Are they asking, why? How can the Chinese come here? And they do what they will and live without consequence. Are they are asking, how is it that the world order is arranged? that when we of the African continent appear in world bodies, whether it's the WHO, we have no vaccines when we are sick. When we appear at the United Nations, we can vote all we want, but a single European country can veto all our votes and neutralize us, giving meaning to the unfortunate situation that we are indeed lesser human beings. How can it be that when they meet a G7 and decide for us, we are not there unless we are invited for a photo opportunity. When they meet a G20, we are not there unless we are invited for a photo opportunity. How can it be? How can it be? Where are our leaders, we ask? How can it be? Where are our leaders in all these? What are they doing about it? What are we doing about it? What must we do about it? Why is it that we have leaders and we cannot feed ourselves because there is a war in Ukraine? How can it be? How can it be that when we have COVID, the claim to fame of our political leaders is that they become multi-millionaires and we don't have vaccines? How can it be? How can it be that we have hostels and all equipment is imported from other civilizations? How can it be? How can it be that we have schools in which we have no faith? How can it be that even our airlines fly aeroplanes that are made by other civilizations and we cannot even run them? How can it be 
There are matters that is not rocket science, such as the provision of electricity, whether you are in Johannesburg in South Africa, or Abuja in Nigeria, or Accra in Ghana, or Nairobi in Kenya, or Bujumbura, or Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso. We cannot provide electricity for our men and women. How can it be? How can it be that we have all the 33 currencies in the world with the RAN, with the medical, with the shilling, with the Naira, with the CD, with all dollars, and those currencies mean nothing. The only currency that we accept as hard currency is the American dollar. How can it be? How can it be that when I travel to Africa, the only credit cards that I have are the Visa and the MasterCard and the American Express and that we have no card of our own? How can it be? How can it be that today when I am traveling across Africa and yet we have leaders, when I'm in Nairobi, Kenya, or in Kampala, Uganda, when I go to a supermarket, there is no supermarket that is our own. I buy from Carrefour, which is French. And when I bought something from Carrefour, which is French, and I bought Kenchik, which is American. And when I want to move, I move in Uber, which is American or Bolt, which is Estonian, and when I want it to be delivered to my house, it is delivered to me by Glovo, which is Spanish, and when I want my house to be guarded, it is by Garda World, which is Canadian. Where are our leaders? These are the questions that I'm asking. How can we possibly be comfortable in such a situation? How can it be? that in many African countries the unemployment rate is anything between 35 and 80 percent. Our young men and women are graduating from institutions but they have nowhere to go. How can it be? Because we are exporting all our jobs. How can it be today that all our manufacturing is happening in China? When I want a flask, the Chinese give it to me. When I want pepper, the Chinese give it to me. When I want a pen, the Chinese give it to me. When I want a pencil, the Chinese give it to me. And when I want shoes, the Italians give it to me. When I want shirts, the Belgians give it to me. When I want watches, the Swiss give it to me. When I want water, the Americans give me Darsani. When I want a cold drink, the Americans give me Coca-Cola. What has happened to us? These are issues that we must wrap our minds around because history has demonstrated times without number that she is only capable of aiding those who are willing to work. I remember that day, courtesy of history. I remember that encounter between Moses and God himself. And I remember Moses walking into the mountain of God. And I remember him lamenting and saying, now that you are sending me to the Israelites, what shall I do? And I remember God telling him, and what do you have in your hand? And he says, this is the only thing that I have in my hand. And he says it is that by that rod and staff that you shall liberate the Israelites. Today, as we talk about the devoted citizen, I hear God asking us, what do you have in your hand? God is asking you, what do you have in your hand? What character do you have that you can use to part the Red Seas that are facing us? What do you have in your hand that you can strike the rocks that water may come out? That is the question that is personal to you. Because when you go out of here, you will be asking yourself, what is it that you can do to change your circumstances? And the last time I checked, there is not going to be a nuclear solution to our problems. It is going to be block by block. 
It is going to be city by city. It is going to be slow and painful, and history has demonstrated that when it is done in that way, then it can last. It is not lost on me that there will be signs and there will be times of pain and sorrow when a forward movement looks like a backward movement, but movement it must be. You know, I remember the great Martin Luther King Jr. talking about leadership and service. And I remember him saying, not in so many words, that when it falls upon your laps to sweep the streets, sweep the streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sip the streets like Mozart composed music. Perhaps if he was in Africa, he would have said, Sip the streets like Lucky Dube composed music. Sip the streets like Femi Anikula Pokuti composed music. I'm now saying that leadership is leadership everywhere. You know, I remember. Because my memory still serves me well. I remember in 1982, I was watching a movie which I commend to all of you. The movie Mahatma Gandhi by Sir Richard Attenborough. And I remember, and I invite you to remember with me, one day, the Mahatma goes to his ashram and he walks into the toilet and he discovers that the toilet has not been cleaned. And he asks his wife, why has the toilet not been cleaned? And it was your turn to clean the toilet. And the wife tells him, how can I clean the toilet? And there are workers to do it. And the Mahatma tells her, it is the all the more reason that you must clean the toilet because that is true service. Tells him that when all is said and done, Perhaps the greatest person in that assembly was the toilet cleaner. I'm urging you that when it falls upon your lap to clean the toilet, clean the toilet so clean that people will say, Behold a great toilet cleaner. When it falls upon your lap to be a musician, sing so well that it may be said of you, you are a great singer. Because that is leadership. Leadership is at all levels. Today, we think that leadership is only political leadership, but many of those individuals who are in the political arena are truly quite a number of them. There are few good ones, but many of them are con men and con women. And it's our duty to expose them for who they are. You know, sometimes I look at us in Africa, And I ask, courtesy of democracy, we are given the opportunity to vote. And the men and women who want us to vote come to us, seeking our mandate that they may serve us. And they tell us many things. And we believe the things that they tell us and we vote them into office. And once we vote them into office, we assume that they'll deliver to us and we go back to sleep. We expect them to preside over the building of our roads. In South Africa, at least don't complain about roads. You are better road than most of Africa. So let us give credit where credit is due. But you tell me you are comparing us with not so good countries, but on the road sector you are doing reasonably well. In other African countries, they don't even do the roads, but they build bridges where there are no rivers. <laughs> then we expect them to do our hostels, and they don't do so. I'm urging us today that as a devoted citizen, it is your duty to remain eternally vigilant 
because history has demonstrated to us that it is only through eternal vigilance that good things are retained and maintained and sustained. Let us also remember that all that we do as devoted citizens are intergenerational. We are the young men and women singing. We must remember that our duty as devoted citizens is to run our baton. Life is a relay race. You know, history teaches me a lot of things and I want history to teach you many things. On the sixth day of March, the year 1997, a great African was invited to Accra, Ghana in the same manner that I'm, I, I'm invited here. That great African was a great Tanzanian, Mwalimu Kambarage Nyerere. And when he was invited, he did not have a written speech, but on that day he said he was going to talk about unity. And he spoke and said, we are gathered here 40 years after Ghana regained our independence. And when we are gathered in that manner, we must ask ourselves certain fundamental questions. What have we done with our independence? And he reminded us that when we were seeking independence, we promised ourselves many things. We promised ourselves that we would fight poverty. We promised ourselves that we would defy ignorance and disease. Let us take stock. Have we eliminated poverty? No, we have not, he said. Have we eliminated ignorance? No, we have not. Have we eliminated disease? No, we have not. But let us be fair, he said, to the generation to which I belong. We have run our race. We may have made mistakes. This generation must now ask itself, what can they do to build on what we started? And he said, in the process of trying to do what we promised ourselves, there are many mistakes that may have been made, and we have made our fair share of mistakes. But what mistake we must never make is the mistake of giving up. We must never make the mistake of giving up we must always say that it can be done and it must be done because if it is not done, then we ourselves will be done. Today, I'm telling us that we have the wherewithal to do it. Sometimes we lament too much. Sometimes we complain too much. Sometimes we quarrel too much. Sometimes we blame too much. Sometimes we think that it's all lost. But I want to tell you that in the struggle for that which is good, there'll be moments of desperation. There'll be moments when you want to give up. There'll be moments when you want to say that it cannot be done. But depression, if it does not become clinical, is useful because it gives you a moment of useful reflection. So today I'm asking you to remember that it can be done and you are the people who can do it. For the younger generation, I am asking you to remember these immortal words of Chinua Achebe of Nigeria. He asked at one moment in a gathering such as this, and where are the young suckers that will grow when the old banana dies? Today I'm happy that I can see the, old, the young suckers that will grow when the old banana dies. And to the young people, I'm also telling you that we must never make the mistake of rubbishing the legacy of those who lived before you. They will have made mistakes, but your duty is to correct those mistakes. Your duty is to look at the foundation stone that they built and build and correct because none of us is without fault. It is our duty, therefore, to go out there it is our duty on an occasion such as this when we are asking are we devoted students to ask ourselves what our ancestors would say today. I am asking you today, you who are South Africans, when Nelson Mandela is up there in heaven, I assume, And even, 
and he is looking down upon South Africa. What questions are Nelson Mandela asking? What questions is he asking? And I hear him asking all South Africans, irrespective of race. When I was here in 1994, when I walked out of prison, did I not say that I've forgiven all of you? He's asking, have we forgiven one another? I hear Nelson Mandela asking, did I not fight that we may have justice? And he's asking, is justice with you today? I hear Nelson Mandela asking, did we not gain independence that our young men and women should be employed? And he is asking, are they employed? I hear Nelson Mandela asking. I hear Nelson Mandela asking, why are you killing yourself in the taverns? I hear him asking. I hear Nelson Mandela asking, was it not the divine instruction that you should be your brother's keeper? Why is rape rampant in this country? I hear Nelson Mandela asking. And he's not the only one who is asking. I hear Robert Mangalisa Sobukwe asking. I hear Chris Hani asking. I hear Winnie Madikezela Mandela asking. They are asking you these questions and I want you to give me an answer. Give me an answer. Are they asking in vain? Could it be that they are asking and saying it was better while we waited? Do you want them to say that it was better while we waited? They are charging us. Those questions should not depress us, but they should energize us. They should tell us that there is work yet to be done. So today, fellow Africans, we are assembled here because we want to be devoted citizens. We are assembled here in a sanctuary where the word of God is spoken every so often. And I feel the Spirit telling us that something must be done, that when you leave here today, it must never be the same again. You know, when I look at the ministry of Christ, when he had been crucified, and the apostles who are with him, each one of them went their way. Each one of them. It was a lost cause. So they thought. But something happened on the journey to a mouse. And then they were assembled as we are here. And then I read and I read right that the Holy Spirit visited them and they spoke in tongues may it be that there is a Holy Spirit that is visiting you and I'm very specific in saying that the spirit should be holy because there is no shortage of other spirits Because you may be possessed, but you may be possessed with the spirit of greed. You may be possessed with the spirit of corruption. You may be possessed with the spirit of racism. You may be possessed with the spirit of danger. I am asking you to embrace the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit tells us that you must only do that which is good and right. The Holy Spirit tells us that you must not be greedy. The Holy Spirit tells us that there is only one race, the human race. The Holy Spirit tells us that it is not by the creed of greed that you must live, but by the creed of God, the Holy Spirit tells me. So let the Holy Spirit come here that you may go out into the society and change the society. You go out there individually, go out there and do that which is good and right. May God bless you.